I'll take this one and I'll call on stage the people that will meet with me will be part of uh, this panel. So Benedetta Arese Lucini, the country manager of Uber. And then Andrea Raimondi, Civic Hacker. And then Maurizio Costa Beber, entrepreneur and CEO of uh, DWS. Please. So they, they added the legs to the sofa, so it, it, it shouldn't be so hard as it was this morning. Um, so welcome everybody and welcome to the audience too. The, the headline of uh, the topic of uh, our panel should be, is it possible to change the rules of the game without changing the playing field? So it's a panel dedicated to people that are completely reshaping the sectors in which the, they operate, either on the public field, either on the private field as the activity as uh, entrepreneurs. And my personal answer to the, to the question is no, it, it is not possible. And in fact, the, the playing field in which uh, everybody operates, our ecosystem is already changed. Um, just a couple of that and then we will dive deep into the stories of, uh, of uh, our panelists. Uh, the first data, there's a research of the Oxford University saying that in the next uh, 20 years, 47% of the jobs, of traditional jobs that we currently have, will not exist anymore. And second data, think of the two iconic companies. One is Kodak. Kodak uh, was the, the uh, paradigm of, uh, of the company of uh, image. Kodak invented digital uh, pictures. Uh, Kodak was not able to innovate and uh, went bankrupt. It went bankrupt the same day that the company that was able to exploit digital uh, image, Instagram, was uh, sold for one billion dollar. When Instagram was sold, it had 40 for zero em employees. At its best, Kodak used to have 145,000 people. So we are in the middle of a huge change that is already taking place. It's the second machine age, and it, its effects in the long run will be very important. But for us, that are, we, we are mid, in the middle of the change, we are, experiences, we are experiencing uh, really big phenomenon that we have to cope with. And we have to choose whether we want to stay on the digital side, on, on the side that will benefit uh, from all these changes, or if uh, our communities, our countries, um, will be lagged behind by what is happening. So here I have uh, three persons that in their fields are, are changing deeply uh, the environment in which they operate. I want to start uh, with uh, Maurizio Costa, Costa Beber. Maurizio, um, I've, I've been knowing him for a while, and uh, as an entrepreneur of uh, the Northeast that used to, to, work, to, to work with uh, jewels, and now he will tell us his story, but he was able to reconvert himself uh, to 3D printing. And in fact, uh, um, a product he, he, he presented at CES in Las Vegas at the beginning of uh, this year uh, competed with some of the biggest uh, 3D printers of huge companies, such as MakerBot and so on. So how is it possible to start from Vicenza and to have a company that more or less has seven million uh, euros 
of uh, a year of, uh, of, um, um, of business and to challenge uh, MakerBot that has, I think, $500 million of capitalization. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. And, um, well, I, I like to explain briefly my story because, uh, uh, as uh, Massimo uh, uh, explained, we, we are coming from Jewelry. And, uh, well, it's a quite a long history. It's starting 20 years ago. Uh, where we, we saw the first 3D printers, industrial printers, uh, abroad, and we, uh, we tried to, to bring this technology to Europe and uh, Middle East. So there was an initial stage where we, we figured out uh, there is a, a new uh, manufacturing uh, method coming on, and this might uh, change. The, the way to produce uh, things, products. And uh, because uh, most of our competitors at that time were uh, not focusing, so uh, spreading in many different areas, uh, we tried to concentrate on a local uh, pride in Vicenza, which is a jewelry manufacturing. And, uh, and, and step by step, we we tried to develop a completely made in Italy technology able to satisfy this high demanding application. So jewelry manufacturing means a very high quality, uh, very high resolution and high productivity and special materials. So the, the challenge was quite hard for us as a startup company. And uh, luckily we, we got good ideas, uh, plenty of uh, Patent, which is one of our strongest area, uh, new material development, uh, and so we could uh, bring to the market an innovative system, uh, which was uh, completely suitable for the jewelry manufacturing process. So, very quickly, this idea to bring a new manufacturing method become became true, as. Uh, not only larger companies started step by step to, to change their factories uh, into this new 3D printing trend, but also uh, hundreds of uh, small uh, businessmen, uh, very often single people, uh, were able to start up an individual company very often in one room in one desk and to be able to uh, develop, manufacture and ship their own products directly. So a kind of a micro factory system. So that was uh, uh, our, let's say, past 20 years history. And, uh, and then came the, the idea of uh, producing the printers. Exactly, exactly. and. Um, well, this has been quickly uh, not only linked to the jewelry uh, manufacturing field because uh, um, we, we think uh, uh, this 3D printing concept might uh, start a new revolution on the industry and so to allow uh, most of uh, individuals uh, like designers, uh, students, uh, uh, artisans to um, uh, to be more flexible, to be able to, uh, to overcome uh, the economic crisis and to, to reduce uh, the, uh, let's say, the infrastructure to the minimum and being able to launch their product into the market. And uh, pursuing this idea, we have created the, the, let's say, personal 3D printer system that we uh, have introduced at the CES uh, last January. And how is it possible to compete with, with such huge competitors uh, being so small? Since the beginning, we were 100% uh, uh, conscious that our size uh, can be a limitation, especially uh, with the larger companies. Uh, most of our competitors are uh, uh, stock listed in the United States, so they are 
several hundred times larger than us. And, uh, and we saw uh, the only way is, uh, is probably what Italians are uh, quite uh, well skilled to do. So to be faster, to be more creative, to invent instead of copying, and to somehow change the rules. So you, you were saying before that you focused a lot on uh, not only on the product, the 3D printer itself, but also on the, on the patterns of the, the materials. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about this? Of course. Uh, well, the 3D printing market industry, let's say, is quite a competitive environment. Uh, we consider it like a Formula One of technology, where changes are coming every second, and uh, the market is global. So, um, by investing uh, a relevant part of our revenues, uh, nearly 25%, in research and development in, in very complicated fields like uh, physics, lasers, for example. We manufacture all our lasers, uh, advanced materials, software. The only way, I mean, not the only, but probably the most uh, uh, suitable way to protect our investment uh, are uh, intellectual property. And, uh, of course, uh, this is quite uh, expensive uh, and complicated. Uh, probably we are one of the few, uh, let's say, small uh, company uh, having uh, more than two people only engaged on patent applications uh, uh, activities. So How many patents do you have at the moment? We have uh, nearly 25 patents, all internationally. Um, extended, and, uh, and they are a kind of, um, let's say, uh, yeah, safety uh, system for us because they prevent uh, most of our competitors to, um, let's say, to, to use our efforts, our discoveries, and to somehow copy what we are doing. Is it, is it true you are currently working and experimenting on artificial teeth? Oh yes, uh, by the way this is already on the market and uh, actually we are the only company worldwide having uh, uh, an advanced material to, uh, to print uh, teeth, uh, let's say uh, crown and bridges uh, using uh, such a uh, biocompatible material that imitates uh, the natural teeth. So, mm. in a few moments we will talk with Benedetta that is sought after by cab drivers. I think you will be sought after by dentists in a short time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I personally think uh, um, this is not only valid for 3D printing, but probably for most of uh, emerging technologies. Uh, I think we cannot uh, uh, be so arrogant to think we can drive these changes. We can only choose to participate to the game. Sure, mm. that's right. Um, from your observatory, what do you think will be the, the most important fields uh, of application of 3D printing? We currently have it in heavy industry, um, some companies are printing parts of, of jet engines. We are currently experimenting them in um, small businesses um, where they, they made a lot easier the, the, the stage of uh, prototyping and of, of uh, uh, passing from, from the design to the, to the final product. And uh, there are also some promising uh, uh, fields like uh, health or food or uh, uh, I've been talking for a while uh, in, the, in the last weeks with a huge entertainment company that is planning to put up um, to, to establish an iTunes of uh, their characters to allow everybody to print their own character personalized in, in some way before then someone else is going to cannibalize them because when, when objects are files, 
it is going to happen the same that happened to music. Uh, there will be an app store sooner or later of objects. So you, we will be able to download files and to print objects. And so they want to, to prevent this and they want to be the first to, to offer to the consumers uh, the possibility of printing their, their characters. But from your own observatory, what, what are the most promising fields of application of uh, additive manufacturing? Well, uh, the, the application fields are quite uh, uh, large and uh, it's very difficult to, to preview, to foresee what will happen in the future. Uh, concerning has uh, that uh, have uh, nearly 37 materials already developed in the, uh, let's say, arena of uh, uh, polymer plastics, uh, ceramics, uh, and uh, flexible materials. Probably an area of uh, strong interest will be for the future uh, what is concerning the uh, conductive materials. So we have already some uh, advanced uh, researches on the way uh, in order to allow the printing in 3D of uh, uh, circuits, electronics, uh, sensors, uh, and uh, devices all in one stage. This, this is probably an area of very, very high interest because uh, it can cross not only consumer electronics but also uh, medical devices, uh, life sciences, and so on. As well as for tissue engineering, which is probably the hardest uh, field. And uh, step by step, uh, I, I think uh, we will find a way to grow a real uh, tissues, uh, if possible, one day organs or whatever, in order to, yeah, to change again the rules. Sure. Um, do you think you, you, you're going to be able to, to, inno to go on innovating and uh, competing or uh, at a certain stage uh, you, you will establish a, a part of your company in the US or uh, sell it or something? What do you see in the future? It's a good question because uh, it is related to the growth and to the future. So uh, we already sell uh, currently in 60 countries. And, uh, you currently sell in 60 in countries? In 60 countries, including the United States. Uh, uh, and and you're, you're now selling, you're now accepting pre-orders for your yeah, new for consumer product? For the personal 3D printer, yes, of course, which is uh, exhibited uh, at the entrance. And uh, we will probably set up some uh, regional uh, uh, offices in order to, um, yeah, to make our growth and distribution easier. But I think uh, research and development will remain in Italy because uh, uh, our territory is uh, uh, providing us uh, all we need uh, as a culture, as a uh, human resources uh, environment, uh, uh, sometimes not really friendly, but uh, uh, a lot uh, uh, stimulating. And, uh, and by the way, we have uh, many foreign uh, researchers uh, joining our team. So you're able to attract uh, new talents? Yes, of course. We are, are currently uh, working with uh, Japanese, uh, Germans, uh, uh, Lebanese, uh, South Americans, uh, so our company is very small, but uh, uh, it welcomes uh, multicultural, multinational personnel. So, yesterday I was talking with a friend of mine, uh, Luca Tomassini, who, who just established, he used to have, he still has a company in Italy that is called Vetria, but they decided to open also uh, a new co uh, in uh, Silicon Valley because it was necessary for the, for the field. Uh, to be in front of innovation, to have also um, a, a quarter there. Uh, so you, you don't see something uh, uh, like that for your company? Not uh, in, uh, let's say, short terms. Uh, well, I think we have uh, many examples for the past uh, where the Italian excellence uh, in terms of research and development uh, 
uh, have produced a unique products. So I, I think it's not uh, interesting for anybody to repeat it, but I think uh, Italy uh, will remain uh, um, a very high potential place for inventions. Last question, how, how many offers to sell your companies you received in the last uh, few months? <laughs> well, uh, it is uh, true that uh, we have uh, many, many inquiries uh, from very large companies uh, uh, and, uh, and they are quite, um, let's say, aggressive because it seems that what we are doing is quite interesting for them. But uh, at the moment, uh, we have uh, no intentions to... You plan to resist. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You think we'll, you can we'll grow do our own. best. <laughs> you think you can grow your own, and this is great. So we will move to a completely different Thank uh, person. Thanks to, to Maurizio. Um, we are moving to a completely different person. Uh, Andrea defines himself as a civic hacker. Can you tell us why? Uh, you introduced me actually as a civic oh, I, I, I read, the, I, I read the, the definition on, yeah, on your true. page. That's so. true. That's true. Basically, I'm here to uh, tell you our experience regarding Aqualta, which is a civic hacking project. Well, what, what is civic hacking actually? Well, it's quite complicated to define, but it's not just hacking in the sense of developer or technical skill. It requires some other skills, maybe the knowledge of how public administration works, or how, what kind of model of society we have in mind and which kind of uh, benefits in terms of business we can obtain if we look at the problem from this firm perspective. So I have a few colleagues and we all come from uh, the Italian Open Data Movement, which has a bigger community which is called Spaghetti Open Data. If you don't know it, please check it after the talk. And um, how Aqualta burned? Actually, the history starts in 2010, in which uh, one of our friends, Oreste, Oreste Venier, in Venice, built and patented this kind of sensor to measure the tide level. And uh, the sensor was acquired by a company that decided to test this kind of sensor, and it tested on the uh, river level situation. Well, the problem with this kind of test scenario was that it suddenly hit a dead end because there was no reason to develop uh, the model and they don't know actually how to employ the sensor in other kind of context. So we, we start thinking what, what kind of solution we can provide to this problem. And uh, as is very well known, Venice has a huge problem of chronic floating, not just Venice. Take, for instance, what happened in the, in the UK this winter. They have very big problem in managing the flow because they don't have data. So they are not able to um, make good provision about what was going to happen. The same happened in Venice. So we decide how to accept an existing solution like the application of sensor to measure liquid level in a situation in which this kind of model can continue to exist. So we decide, of course, to include the community. And we, we thought, what about asking people to adopt a sensor and install in their houses? Well, we actually did it. And we figured out a way to convince people to adopt the sensor, which is basically very simple in their work. The sensors are uh, very low energy costs. It just works with solar energy. Uh, and uh, it goes online on the Wi-Fi connection that you have in your house, and it measures continuously the level of tide. But the benefit that you have, and that all these data are put online as open data. So everybody, everyone that wants to build models to maybe evaluate the kind of uh, tides, behavior that happened during years, are in a situation to test this kind of hypothesis and models. The other kind of benefits is uh, social benefits because it puts you in a situation to include technology in your everyday life, not something as um, 
different from the analogic world that we live. So the, the, the benefit of sensor technology is that sensor is actually a social raw entity because we share with sensor the ability, for instance, to feel the environment and to integrate local information even from the global point of view. This means that you are able to create an ecological distributed system to manage and extract information from the analogic world. What kind of benefit is this, as this actually Venice has a system to check and control the tide. So our model is not in opposition to that model, but the research, private or public research institute, are part of our model. So take, for instance, the case in which uh, the Tide Research Center in Venice has 10, and they have to spend 10 on the infrastructure to maintain and build new infrastructure. We start thinking, what about if we create a very low cost, because of course sensors are quite... What, what is the cost of uh, your sensors? Well, actually, if, if you think about uh, maybe a, a common example, Arduino, that probably everybody knows, is something very, very cheap. Maybe if you apply sensor to Arduino, it's about 50 euros, but it's low cost in respect to high... So the top. below 50 euros? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you have the benefit in saving a lot of money because it's a bottom-up infrastructure, not a top-down infrastructure. So our idea is, uh, since we are always forced, especially in our country, to face emergency situation, Let's just try to build a, a very distributed, low-cost infrastructure so that, for instance, the Tide Research Center in Venice does not, is, not, is not forced to spend 10 on infrastructure, but it can spend 7. So the, the three point that it saved, it can spend to buy more researchers. They can develop model, they can perform valuable information, predictive information to the behavior of the tide. So you're suddenly going out the repeatedly situation of emergency in which everybody should leave their houses or move the stuff. And you have a benefit in that, that you invest money, not just in infrastructure, but on research. That means that you are, able, you are able in a better and an effective way to predict what is the behavior of some environmental factor sure. that you don't know about it. And how many sensors do you have in place at the moment? Actually, we have a, a available 15 sensors. We have uh, convinced three persons to adopt the sensor. We have, we have checked if the quality of the information, of course, uh, that the sensor provides is at least similar to the sensor that the Tide Research Center is has. It? It's equal exactly the same. So basically, if you put money on very, very low investment on distributed infrastructure that extract data from an analogic world, you save money to pay more researcher to better predict phenomena. That means that it's a, it's a social benefit for the community. Because of course, if I am a citizen, and I know that my money has spent in a certain way, and I don't see the benefits, well, uh, I can get angry about it. But in Venice, they're having some problems at the moment with the money spent for the tax. Uh, indeed, indeed. So sometimes it just, um, it's just a matter of changing the approach and see things from other kind of perspective. Indeed, to build concept, we are always interested in build mathematical or um, economical model of situation. But when, what we do when we do these things in, is taking a problem inside society which is a high complex embedded system, and we're trying to reduce that problem to a situation which we, with which we can deal with a mathematical model. So we start building models, testing this model with respect to a non-problem. And maybe that model can work, but we don't solve the situation. Like, for instance, in artificial intelligence, we are very far from building intelligent machine because we build model on, on, on non-problem. So our idea is to try to account for the complexity of societal problem, approaching a kind of uh, ecological model of solution. And this is quite simple. It just requires a new kind of thinking of the problem. I, I can think of a metaphor, for instance. You can think of Escher architecture. You know, when, when you move the Escher figure, you have, from each different point of view, new path 
of development. And if you continue turning the feature, you see path that you, previ you previously didn't think about it. So building conceptual model, not opposed to economic and business model, of course, but as an, inter an integrative approach to business, may have several benefits. So, so if, if I understand correctly, what you're saying is that if you're able to exploit the net effect, so the fact that everybody could be a node of a, of a huge network, and uh, if, if we are able to transform ourselves in sensors, because uh, the Internet of Things allows us to, to do that, uh, we have now um, a completely different framework to, exactly. to try to solve problems that are very complex. It's even more than this because probably some people are not, so, not, not agree on the idea of people being sensor. It's not that exactly the way. So for instance, when we, we used to think in living in, a, we are organism, we live in the environment, but we do more than living in an environment. We do things on the environment. We build niche to provide better solution to our problem and to accept older solution to novel use as to reuse something that we are able to do. So the relation between the sensor and the person that adopt the sensor is a, a kind of symbiotic relation. We have very different kind of example of this. For instance, you, are, you will be not able to live without your bacteria inside of you. Well, our idea of biological individuality is quite wrong we, because we presuppose that we, we are the only one that inhabits our body. So if you, if you assume an ecological point of view of business, you can have a lot of benefit that, it's, that are beyond the mer not the more, I mean, they are beyond the simple profit. So for instance, if you assume that kind of conceptual model that we use and we tested actually as a case instance in Venice, you, have an, you can have several benefits. First benefit is a social benefit. You can reuse existing solution and existing skills in the territory. So for instance, you have artisans that builds things and you can train that artisan to build digital object. So for instance, suppose there is um, um, a person near Bologna that invent a sensor and this sensor, uh, and they meet a company that are interested in, t in testing the sensor in different kind of context, has to have more information about business plan maybe too to improve, well, you have the opportunity as an artisan, and as a simple artisan, to make money about that in a very easy way, something that is inconceivable. So this kind of model, it's a way to reevaluate the skills and the abilities. As, as you say, we are very creative people, and sometimes the only, the only barrier between uh, we, our, our creativity and the real effect in the real life is that we are not so able to think hard problem like how to solve complex problem in society. Or you can have uh, other kind of benefits. For instance, look at the Biase talk about uh, what, it, what, what is to be smart. Maybe we, we know the kind of buzzword like smart city and something like this. Well, smart, what makes a city smart, for instance, is not the amount of technology that it has, but how these technological solutions are integrated. Because society is uh, it's, it's a complex system it, that is made from different levels, and these different levels interact each other as to alter each other contribution. So to observe a society from the outside, it's very difficult. You have to be inside the community to exploit the benefit. So for instance, if you are in a city, the capacity of having sensor around you gives you the ability to make better decision or a better decision about allocating budget or deciding new way of building transport just sure. because you know what is going on around you. Sure. And of course, another benefit that you have is a sort of academic benefit. We train a lot of high-level researchers that sometimes get unemployed very easily, and we spend a lot of money training those people. Well, if you have a, 
available a lot of data about the environment, even if you are freelance or even if you are private or in an institutional environment, you can use those data to provide new model of prediction of behavior or some kind of phenomena. So for instance, I, I met a professor in Nottingham University, which I, which I, which I work in, and um, he got this big project founded by Horizon 2020. It was about model to predict how to combine uh, intelligent grid to control the temperature in a city. But they have a big problem. They have money for funding. They have the model, but they don't have the data because they need very fine-grained data, like each temperature of each floor of each building inside the city. So you, you are in a situation in which you have the money, you have the tool, you don't have the, the knowledge. So the, the idea of this model is to free the knowledge from our analogic world and build digital ecosystem. If we do that, we have a kind of conceptual model of business. So we, there are plenty and huge opportunities that we can try and, and to exploit if we uh, exploit what we have now, Internet of Things, uh, the huge exactly. computational growth, uh, uh, the fact that, that everybody, every, every one of us, you know that uh, <laughs> this has more computational power than the US government had in the 80s. Absolutely. And, and we, it, it, it depends on us whether we want to use it uh, for playing Candy Crush or, or using it uh, for more fruitful things. So the last question, um, yeah, going back to the definition of a civic hacker, um, <laughs> 10 years from, from now, uh, how you would uh, define your mission uh, accomplished? What should happen? Thanks for pointing out. I think that uh, one of, one, when, I, when I was working on, on the model, I was thinking, of course, but by my background, my backdrop, which is a sort of activist backdrop. And I was thinking one of the m main point is that the business we do now shape the society with that we will have in the future. So we have to be careful about the, the decision we make now in how to shape our business because they will, they will shape the society in which uh, me and uh, everybody and our children will live. So I was asking myself, what kind of society of information do we want for us in the future? And um, I can say what I don't want. So for instance, for me, a free society of information from now to 10 years is a society in which there is no, there is this philosopher that call it this jargon, this epistemic injustice. There is the, the problem of having different class of people and each class has different access to information. So I want a society that does not have an epistemic injustice just because the access to knowledge is basically what gives you the ability to do things. So I want that in a future society, everybody have access to knowledge to do things because we are able to be the better society. And of course, the, the positive, the, the benefits, the positive argument in favor of sensor technology, that is very cheap. So basically, we avoid the problem of economic access to digital information because if I, if I don't have the money to access, uh, various kind of tool to build my own business, well, I'm cut it off from the business as a whole from society. Sure, sure. Thank you, Andrea. Andrea Raimondi. Thank you. So, Benedetta, nice to see you. Thank last, you. last time we met, uh, it was not su such a pleasant place. No. <laughs> it wasn't. It was we weren't even able to talk. <laughs> we weren't able to talk. We had the police uh, trying to protect us. We had the cab drivers uh, sh shooting eggs to us and, and so on. Um, so it may be that someone in the, in the um, audience uh, d doesn't know exactly what is Uber. Can you tell us what Uber is? 
Yeah, of course. So you were just talking about mobile phones and how we are all living with smartphones. And I think uh, the real revolution of Uber is to apply the geolocalization and the easiness of smartphones and the power of smartphones to the world of transportation. And the idea is through an app to connect a person to its own personal driver. So every person who downloads the app can instantly be geolocalized and in, with the press on one button be connected to a car that will come pick them up. Um, Uber started with a limo kind of service, so in Italy it's NCC, Noleggio con Conducente, um, and it's a little bit of a higher end product, uh, but one of the more revolutionary products that Uber has launched since 2012 in the US and 2014 in Europe is uh, what we call here Uber Pop, and it's peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, what we do is we connect people with other people, and we, uh, in the context of the sharing economy, help fill cars, take cars off the road, and actually make more efficient the transportation of people. So everybody becomes a driver and can drive and benefit from carrying other people with him or her. Exactly. So the, the driver benefits because he's utilizing the car. So there's research, research says that a person actually uses a car less than one hour a day on average, and the cost of a car is quite expensive still. So this is the idea of the sharing economy is that you're you're utilizing more an existing asset that is underutilized. So the, the community benefits from it and the cab drivers hate you. <laughs> the, the other day there was uh, this, um, this uh, European strike. What, what, one of the few Euro European things we have been able to do is a strike against uh, Uber. Um, cabs were on strike in London, in Madrid, in uh, Berlin, and I saw there, were, there was a huge uh, increase in the download of, uh, of your app. I know you have a, a, a slide with you we yes. can show. We can show this. So this is the, it's actually the full day, it's the time of the day for the the day of the strike, and these are the actual rank of the Uber app in all the countries where there was a strike. And this is like through the day how the app got in every single country like to top 10. Uh, so, so in Italy you were at uh, 250 more yeah. or less place, and now you are in the... Like three. Yeah, you are number <laughs> three in Italy. So th this is the effect of the strike of the other day. Yes. Okay. Um, I know also Nelly Cruz the other day uh, wrote a post in a blog about, about uh, Uber as a paradigmatic uh, story of what the sharing uh, economy is, is bringing with us, it, uh, with, with it. And um, she more or less said that we, we need to cope with it and find the way to benefit from it and not just close the door uh, to it. Um, but it is not just a matter of uh, cab drivers because you've, you've, it's been difficult until now uh, for you also the relationship with uh, the cities. Now you're starting to have relationship with institutions and the city councils. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So um, obviously Uber has the belief that the customer and uh, the proof of it, the business, will will provide the opportunity to, to governments to shape uh, regulation in order to provide more choice. Uh, one of the biggest things that happened is in the same week where Europe was striking, actually Colorado made ride sharing legal and it's the first law, uh, full law. So California has already had a bill but it's the first full law that regulates ride sharing. And so I think this, this is the very powerful, uh, it's a very powerful thing because what's happened is um, the, the taxi industry, especially also in Italy, has been, tr has been, there has been a lot of regulators that have tried to liberalize it uh, unsuccessfully. And the new market, and it's not just Uber, but many other apps who are in this market are actually managing to move regulation by what the market is, is 
doing. But the Italian Secretary of Transport said that Uber Pop is illegal. Yes, so I think that uh, there was a situation in Milan at that point where we had had five days of strike and there needed to be some sort of message. Uh, what is really um, empowering for us is that there is a lot of, there are, first of all, Renzi uh, clearly mentioned the benefits of Uber um, the same day. And then there's a lot of people nationally where I go meet on a regular basis that believe that this kind of innovation is disruptive but will bring um, a lot of like uh, benefits to the Italian economy and jobs. There's a, there's a study, an independent study that was done on Chicago in 2013, which showed that Uber, just Uber, brought a thousand new jobs, um, 46 million dollars of, of growth to the, to the economy of Chicago, and 25,000 more trips of people who would have used their own car. So in just one year, you can see the benefits of a city. So what we need to do is go to these institutions and educate them on the benefits of not just Uber, but a whole market that can exist. But did you uh, receive any of official message after the Secretary of Transport uh, said uh, that Uber Pop is not legal? No. Uh, no. So uh, what, uh, what I've been asked a lot is, um, so he, he said on the newspaper that you're illegal, what are you going to do about it? And the first thing I obviously did was let's meet and let him, let me tell him about Uber Pop and not somebody else. And uh, hopefully we are going to be meeting with, uh, with the ministry soon. I know there's a, there's a, um, an understanding that there should be a table of uh, discussion around transportation and how it's changing, and all the different players will be invited to discuss this. So we are still waiting for this table. You're still waiting. And, and at the moment, uh, um, Uber Pop is up and running in Milan. Yes, and, yes, and during the, the strike of the 11th, thankfully for Uber Pop, a lot of people managed to get around Milan. How many drivers you have uh, in, in, uh, in Milan right now, both in, in black and in pop? So we don't give exact numbers, but uh, what is incredible is that, you know, the market of limo drivers is constrained also by licenses. So we probably in a year and a half has managed to get, you know, over like 60, 70 percent of all the limo drivers that work in Milan collaborate with Uber. We don't do any exclusivity so they can work. It's an integration. They, yes, they, they one hour on. when they have time. So we've had a lot of good support by that, uh, by that community and when we launched POP it was because our demand was growing even faster. We couldn't manage to keep up and it was a project that I really believe in because it's, uh, it's really disruptive. Uh, and the day we launched after the Wired Express, we got thousands of applications of people who are wanting to be pop drivers. And do you make any checks? Because Noleggio con Conducente, who has a license, uh, yeah. uh, also has, is checked by, by, by the state for a lot of things. Uh, what kind of checks do you make on if, if I apply to be a, a pop driver? Yeah. That's why we have like thousands still in the system because we take security very seriously. So we have a lot of checks. So when somebody applies, we invite them for a, for a meeting and, and like an interview. And before that, they have to upload in our system uh, their, the proof of their license that is not expired, the fact that their license has not been suspended and their um, background checks. So criminal background records have to be clean and their car has to be no more than eight years old, have for at least four people, a space for four people in the car. The car has to be brought to us at the interview so we can check how the car is and also the insurance and, and that it has been like, uh, um, uh, like kept properly. So uh, how is the profile of the average pop driver? It's an actually, it's a very interesting question because we believe that the, when I launched, I thought that the pop driver um, would be like the young student. 
Um, and actually, we do have a lot of younger students who participate on the platform and maybe like a couple of hours during the weekend have time to do this and, and keep the cost of their car low. Um, but we've had like from the, you know, uh, pension person who's uh, a little older who's, who comes to bring his daughter to work or niece and then it takes a few hours to, to do this role. The, the really fun part of POP is the people sitting next to you. So we've had like, uh, I got on a car with a guy who has worked uh, for years in the tech industry also and he just enjoyed the idea of the product. We have lawyers, we have all kinds of professional people who do this as a interesting new concept and they, they see the idea of like, it's like Airbnb, not everybody who puts a car on Airbnb is a, like, wants to be like a hotel manager. It's just normal people who like the idea of this concept. Sure. Going back for a moment to Uber Black, um, we made a test at Wired and we, we took uh, a, cab dra a cab and uh, a Uber uh, car to go to the same place in the same day with two different journalists. So what we found is what we expected, uh, a better service, a better car, um, the, the fact that the, the, the easiness of, of the um, procedure because you don't have to pay, you are registered, so it's, everything is really smooth. But on the other hand, the, the cost is higher. Um, so it's more or less what we expected. So why do we think that cab drivers are so mad about Uber if at the end uh, it's a kind of different market from what they currently have? So I, I believe that the real issue is that there's been a change in the market of transportation. And it's not just Uber, there's Car2Go, there's Enjoy, there's, a, there's Blah Blah Car outside the city. There's a lot of different solutions that are changing the way people expect transportation to be. The second part of it is Uber creates a pressure on the industry to improve. So the service, because of the feedback, we pro like there's a feedback at the end of each trip. So this obviously makes sure that the level of service is, is very good. We, we personally check the, the rating of drivers that have a problem and instruct them to improve. And if they don't, we decide to take them out of the system. So there is a, like a community that keeps the service very high. There is a completely cashless system. These are all things that now the users are expected to have. And when they use another product, they're, they're upset because they don't get it. So it's not like, and this is why in other markets, we, we are complementary. Like we have Uber Taxi. We just launched it in London. Uh, we, we have it in New York and we are very open to do this in Milan also because we understand that there is a pressure on the taxi industry to evolve and that's why they're angry. Sure, sure. They, they understand that, that you are somehow the flag of, of a sector that is completely reshaping itself. Uh, one more question. They usually depict uh, Uber as a, a huge uh, multinational uh, driven by uh, um, very greed bankers that want to cut uh, uh, tax drivers' uh, jobs. How many people uh, do you have in Italy? We're actually in six. Six people? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I, you, you are the, the CEO. Can, can we tell your age? Yes. So I'm you, 30. You're 30. And your colleagues? They're all between 25 and 28. <laughs> Until last week, I saw on the walls in Milan uh, many, many pictures of you with uh, defamation and bad words. And is this a problem for you? Obviously, it's not pleasant. Uh, what, I, what I love about Uber is that the company gives you the opportunity to really disrupt at a local level. And the six people that, that work are three in Milan, three in Rome and we're all Italians, we all believe in this project, not much for Uber because 
Milano and Rome are two of 130 cities around the world. We open a city in China, which is much bigger, but it's more about the people who are in Milan who really believe in this project and believe in it for Italy, not for Uber. It's, it's because it's, and so the, the, the part that, that is sad is that in, we've seen in Italy more than in other countries, of course we've had strikes, but no violence and no threats the same way on the people and not on the company. So there's, a, there's this disruption, like this disconnect between the fact that people are really, like they love the, 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 the work and every day, even though there's problems, me and my team go to work every morning and try to make it work and try to make it better, not for Uber, but for Italy. And on the other hand, we see a huge uh, barrier that is Italian and it's sad for me to have to say it to the other countries that I have this kind of violence that I have to deal with it because it's bad for Italy. Last time we met uh, you had bodyguards. Yes. Do, do you still have them? Yes. Uh, right day. now, yes. Every, every, every time I travel I, I, I have to for the, I mean, I believe that it's not, as you know, it's not the whole industry, but it's probably the, the act of a few. But obviously as a company, we, we, they're very serious about our security and, and right now the office address is known and we're gonna change the office we're in and the security of myself and my employees is like the most important thing for now. Thank you, Benedetta. So, any questions? One question over there. Are we on time? Okay. Um, I have a question for all three, so uh, we, we'll see who, who's going to reply to this. But um, my question is about how you connect good ideas and ideas that work today. Um, I'll make an example. Let's say uh, at some point we will need uh, a good sensor that's going to be uh, enclosed into something that's being 3D printed on uh, taxis or or cars. Let's say, let's say this happens. That's a combo. <laughs> today, today, how do you connect good ideas? Because I, I think this is key. Like we have many people with good ideas and no good or standardized ways to connect them to make them work together. Wants to take this? <laughs> well, actually, this is one million dollar question: how to connect good ideas. I think that, for instance, one element that we used to underestimate in business is the kind of relation that people has between them. Like, for for instance, my case in Nacualta, friendship was um, a great point on which based our 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 idea on bu of business model because we actually are friends and we start talking a lot about how to develop the model. But, um, well, how to connect good, good ideas is quite difficult. Any ideas you? <laughs> I personally experimented that uh, uh, the best way is to have a face-by-face -face conversation. I think it's very difficult to, to, uh, yeah, to, to, to connect ideas, feedbacks, uh, uh, if you are not uh, in front of each other. This is what I experienced in many exhibitions. This is something uh, still analogic in, <laughs> in your experience. Yes, yes, absolutely. Not digital mm -hmm. yet. Very conventional way. <laughs> Benedetta, what about you? I actually have an opposite uh, idea for me. So I've lived in eight different countries in the last 10 years and uh, it's very hard if I didn't use digital technology to keep connected to those network of people that I've learned to know in the different areas. I think that uh, events like these are great ways for getting people to connect, but there is a place where you just have to, you know, bother people online until you get, a, get them to meet you. And I, I do think that uh, the culture of Silicon Valley is like this. There's no person who is unaccessible, and that's the great part, because that's when small entrepreneurs manage to go knock on the door of Walgreens and say, hey, I have this idea, 
can we talk about it together? So digital helps you connect. I agree you can have a face-to-face -face meeting, but it's also about this entrepreneurial nature of saying, hey, you and I should meet. So I, I still think technology helps that. One more question. I, I would like just to add something to that, maybe, I, I don't know the, the, the point of your question, but you, you can go two ways, so for instance, try to, try, to, try to work with people with different life experience and different skills, so to have different approach to the same problem that really enrich teamwork. And second, try to argue for your position on the problem even if you disagree with your team because disagreement is important because it forces you to argue for what you are saying and maybe arguing with another people that disagree with you can help you fix some very good point on the problem because I mean that we, we have the, the idea that we possess our idea but this is not true we, we, sh we create it by sharing our knowledge if we share them we both have two so there was an, another hand raised here and one over there. Can we get a mic there? I have a mic. Oh, OK. One there. Okay. Hi there. Um, one question about sharing economy somehow. Uh, in the sharing economy, uh, users, they share experience or values or whatever without using money. For, for example, Time Republic and, and many other platforms. What for Uber Pop is concerned, what about uh, making it a platform where users can share in sort of carpooling without exchanging money, having you as an authority who keeps on doing the checks. So that would probably make it legal because there's, there's no money exchange between users. Maybe it could be an idea. Sharing economy, sometimes it's a solution. Thank you. Uber Pop is absolutely legal. Uh, the way we've framed it is as a reimbursement, uh, nothing in this world would come for free. The people who actually are invested in taking the time and using their car need to see the return of the, at least covering the cost of their car. So by that definition, it is free. It's not like a income generating kind of uh, solution. But in a short time, we will have self-driving cars collecting us. So wh when is Uber planning to, to use them? So actually, Travis, who is the CEO of Uber, Travis Kalanick, uh, when we first did our funding round with Google, went to try a self-driving car and came back telling us he was scared. <laughs> so. The day we put self-driving cars on, this, on our system is going to be uh, a day we feel that they're safe because security for us is really important. On the other hand, we don't want to shy away from disrupting our own model because these are the ways like successful companies survive when they sure. continue disrupting to disrupt themselves. themselves. Yes. Sure. Yeah. There was um, one last question. So somebody asked about how do we connect people who are doing interesting things to each other. And I think each of us has the ability to act as a connector. So I mean, I know of two, two uh, community water sensing projects in the US that, that I would love to, to connect him with. And you know, when, when we hear about these things and we know this person over here should talk to this person over here, you know, at this, this sort of event and doing that, I think that that is doing what the questioner asked, in my opinion. So this was a statement, a strong statement, more, more than a question. One, one last, if we do? OK, well done. So I want to thank personally Andrea, Maurizio, and Benedetta, and thanks to our audience. <laughs>